This is a portfolio. Yes, the real OG portfolio. Now this can be opened because this is like a case or a folder and you can put stuff inside. What kind of stuff? When you are back in school, this would mostly be papers like your certificates and mark sheets which would speak about your credibility. Now that you have become a professional, these are your real work. Yes, you put your real work inside. So friends, this video is going to be all about that and everything that I think you should know to have that kick-ass portfolio that stands out. Stay tuned. my channel this is Sapta and if you're here for the first time this is the place where I help designers build and scale their career with tips suggestions and tutorials so if you're into it don't forget to hit the subscribe button just like any design process the first step towards creating a portfolio is to understand what a portfolio is and what purpose it serves a portfolio is an evidence of your professional ability it is that concrete proof which should make even a stranger believe into how good you are at your work. And how do you do that? By having your work inside your portfolio. Simple. For example, a painter may have their paintings inside, which will be a testimony of their vivid imagination, creativity, the, the characteristic style of their brush strokes, and so on and so forth. Similarly, a writer may have their transcripts of their writing. Likewise, an architect may have their sketches and so on. So as a digital experience designer, you might be thinking that the screens that you design for devices like this are the evidences of your capability. Well, they are, but that's just one part of it. Let me explain. Your designing abilities are not limited to screens alone. Yes, they may be the final outcomes, but there's a whole bunch of other things which are equally important if not more. Speaking in the context of a movie, how would you feel if you enter a movie theater and all that you are shown is the last scene? which says the end and they lived happily ever after. Well, okay, they lived happily ever after, but how did that happen? How did they end happily? What did they do to achieve it? What obstacles did they face? How many villains did they beat up? So on and so forth. You will have all these questions in your mind. In short, you would want to see the entire story and not just know the final outcome. It's the same in design. Design has two broad directions. The first one, of course, is the hands-on or the craft side of things, which is about creating the assets and the screens for devices like this, which you already know. The second side of design is the analytical side. That is your thought process, your rational behind a particular decision, why you arrived at a particular condition or why did you do something, your validations and your assumptions and so on and so forth. Hence, the ideal content for a portfolio of UX is not screens, not images, but a combination of all of them. They are called case studies. Now, case study is just a fancy name. It's actually the story of how you designed it. Any story has two crucial parts, the starting question and the ending answer. In the same way, your UX story or your case study has a starting problem and it ends when the problem is solved. And in between, there are the series of events in which you might have thought strategically, connected the dots, taken some decision, known more about the user, arrived at conclusion, and finally arrived at the best possible solution, keeping all the constraints in mind. When you write about all these events, that's nothing but your UX story or your case study. That's it. In short, it's a justification of why you picked up this particular approach and not the hundred other which could have been possible. Is there any template for case studies? Nope, there is no prescribed template for case studies. Now, since this is a story, it's usually left up to you how you want to narrate it. And it's usually a combination of text plus images plus sketches and any other artifacts that you want to put in your documents. It's, it's like a blog post, like text, images and various other things. If you read other case studies on the internet, you would see many designers like to include pictures of uh, flowcharts, the sticky notes that they might have stuck, photos of them speaking to users while they're interviewing, alternate approaches that they might have tried, and a host of other things, wireframes and final screens and a lot of other things. Now, all these are good steps, but not mandatory. Before you think of adopting any of these for your case study, 
Ask yourself, what is this step going to add to my story? Is it going to make it better? Is it going to add value to it? If the answer is yes, please go ahead and do it. But if the answer is no, you might even choose to skip it. Keep in mind that do not do anything just for the heck of it. Because somebody else has done, I need to do it as well. Nope, that shouldn't be the case. If you do something, make sure you have proper justification as to why you have done it. On which platform should I have my portfolio? Well, there are a lot of options. There are lots of free options on the internet like Behance, Medium. You might even make your own website where you write your case studies. I personally prefer Medium because it's a ready-made platform which is already there. You don't have to think about you know, how, to, how to format it or what kind of text to use because everything is taken care of by the tool itself. All that you need to do is just concentrate on the content that you're writing. So my personal preference is Medium, but feel free to choose yours. No matter which platform you choose, make sure that it's a link. It's in the form of a link which can be shared. PDFs aren't the best idea. I know many designers have their portfolios on PDFs, but come on, this is 2020 and sharing a link is much easier than sharing an attachment, right? Yeah, but that's just a personal preference. Now with links, it becomes very easy to share your portfolio with other people. Which means while your portfolio is being reviewed by a reviewer, it's highly possible that you are not seated right in front of them. Because you might have dropped the portfolio over an email or something and the recruiter or the, the designer would probably look at it at their own convenience when they are free or something. Now that changes a few things, which requires you to take a few extra steps. I like to call it the UX of your UX portfolio. First and foremost, set the context of your case study in the most concise way possible. Clearly call out the problem that you're solving, who are the people who are facing this problem, and what makes you feel that this problem needs to be solved. Since you're not seated in front of the reviewer, for instant clarifications and justification, make sure that your case study is self-explanatory. At any point of time, it shouldn't feel confusing or out of context. Also, think about the user of your portfolio. Who's the user? It's the recruiter or a designer from the company who's reviewing your portfolio. Now, what kind of people are they? They must be busy, right? They must be receiving such portfolios, a lot of them on a daily basis. Do they have all the time to read each and every word that you write? Maybe not. So make it easy for them. They'll thank you for that. You may follow the newspaper approach. Now, if you read each and every word in a newspaper, obviously you will know everything that is happening around you. But even if you do not read every word, but just scan through the headlines, the bullet points, the highlighted text, the images, tables, and so on, you will still have a fair idea of what's happening around you. Maybe your case study should be written in that way. If someone reads the whole thing, well and good. Even if they do not read the whole thing, they still have a good idea about what you have done. Now you might be thinking you are a beginner and you do not have real projects to show. And what do you do? You can always have mock projects. Pick up any problem that you feel the world is facing and work towards it with the same dedication as you would had it been a real project. Remember, the project can be mock, but your work is always real. It's totally fine. Some of you might even be thinking, hey, I have way too many projects that I've done as a part of my coursework. Which one should I put and which one should I not? Pick up two to three detailed ones that you are most proud of. You can keep the remaining aside. And if you're into multiple disciplines, say you're into UX, also into illustration and branding, make sure you keep them separate. You can have one portfolio for your UX related case studies, two or three of them, and then you can have a separate portfolio for your illustrations or branding or something. And in case you want to show off those extra skills into your UX portfolio, you can subtly do that as well. You can subtly drop a side note saying that, hey, you see that logo out there? That's not a stock image. I made it. But don't bother explaining the branding process and all because that's not needed for a UX case study. Now that you know the fundamentals of how a UX portfolio should be, get going, get started. Give your best and nail it. And if you want to get it reviewed, you can always get on a call with me. The link is calendly.com slash PR. I will leave the link in the description. 30 minute slots where you can get on a call with me, where you can take me through your portfolio and I can give you feedback based on what I think. I hope you learned something new from this one. See you guys in the next one.